All righty. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. I uh, have a special guest. Um, we're going to jump right into it. So my guest today needs no introduction if you're a fan of Reptile YouTube. He's the founder of Reach Out Reptiles, the winner of the 2021 Snake Discovery Enclosure Build-Off, host for the USR YouTube channel along with two of his own, monthly podcaster from Searchable as Reptiles. Everyone say hello to uh, Garrett Hartle. Uh, Mr. Garrett Hartle, say hello to the people. How are you today? Hello, people. I'm doing well. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm good. Thank you very much. Uh, so this this format, uh, I, I like to host it on Zoom. That way we can get folks asking questions in live. So it's a little different from YouTube live, um, awesome. but uh, not terribly. So um, as they come along, I'll, I'll answer those questions. Garrett, if, if you see them on the chat and you want to say something, feel free, but I will, uh, I'll direct them. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll jump into it. Um, in, in Gary, you've told your story in the past on, on a lot of other outlets, um, a lot of your stories. They're, they're great, you know, buying the $5,000 geckos as a teenager, um, keeping rattlesnakes under your bed in cardboard boxes, alligators in the bathroom. Uh, all, all of it is hilarious, uh, but not what I want to talk about here. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, you started off here in California, uh, volunteering and then, and then working for Jay's Prehistoric Pets, and you had some success there. And, and, and I kind of wanted to start, you know, linear. We'll start there. Start with your success there. Um, that, that's what I want to talk about. How were you successful in, in sales there? I remember one of the stories you've told was that, um, uh, and I don't want to say you turn the business around because I, I don't know what shape they're in, but, but you've commented that, you know, Jay and his wife had, had told you, you know, Gary, you've done a great job and, and really helped the company out. So I kind of wanted to start there and see where, where your success started and, and, and from there, how, what did you do to make that job special? And from there, what did you do to, um, well, let me let me reword that. How did you decide from there that you want it to be your own brand? Yeah, um, I uh, so I even before I worked at Prehistoric, I had a little bit of reptile experience on my own. Um, I had bred most notably commercially leopard geckos. There were some high end ones and stuff. I actually bought my first high end one from Jay as a kid, like way before I worked at Prehistoric. I doubt he even knew me. Um, and to your point about, you know, turning a business around or whatever, I, I was specifically in charge of reticulated Python, well, online sales, which was like 99% reticulated Pythons um, while I was there. So there's whole other aspects of that business that yeah. I didn't really have anything to do with. And all of their success on social media and everything today is definitely not due to me. That guy is a, a beast. Totally. I, can't, a, I can't yeah. imagine his schedule. <laughs> yeah, they got a zoo, a pet store, all of that. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, I would think it's more a matter of perspective. I, I think where most people fall short with sales because there's a million different ways to do it, depending on what you're doing. Are you breeding, you know, for quantity? Are you doing like small specialized stuff? Are you, you know, how are, you know, what are you exactly trying to do? I think they, the area most people fall short is that they, they try to do this like linear business with no experience. So it's one thing to say, open a, an online retail store. Let's say I sold, you know, uh, custom crocheted animals mm -hmm. and I open an online retail store. That's going to be difficult for me to to break into that market and understand how that there's gonna be a, a big learning curve to that. Um, maybe it's something like doing uh, social media, you know, whether it's interviews like this, YouTube shows, maybe I'm a TikTok superstar or whatever, that's gonna have a huge learning curve that you need to figure out. And then if you add to that, like the husbandry and breeding of a particular species or multiple species of animal, mm. And try to do all that at once while you have a full-time job. That just seems like you're setting yourself up for kind of like business failure, if you will. Um, on the other hand, if you can take a piece at a time and figure it out, then that's the best way to do it. So it doesn't necessarily matter, I don't think, which piece you start with, as long as you, you piece it together over time. So... I had a, a little bit of a hostile takeover at Reach Out Reptiles. Um, I was, for whatever reason, created to sell reptiles. I don't know. You know, some people are like Olympic gymnasts. 
Some people are born to be a teacher. I'm like born to sell reptiles, not, not even sales guy, just selling reptiles because I've failed at sales and other industries and stuff like that. So I don't know why it's that specific, but it is. And so when I started at Prehistoric, like you said, they weren't doing well in business. They didn't have the job openings. And um, I was kind of hanging out because I had had a horse accident. And so I was like physically on disability for about a year. And I would just go hang out down there because I love the animals and hanging out with them and stuff like that. It was around the time, it was a little before they started their zoo uh, when I first started going there. So it was an exciting time to be there. And eventually I talked them into hiring me as their rodent breeder, mm-hmm. which was awful. I'm allergic <clears throat> to rodents. It was a terrible thing, but I just took, uh, took it as a foot in the door uh-huh. situation. And their sales guy at the time was, he was a hobbyist for sure. Um, and he was more, of, I think, focused on collecting animals for the pet store or on company money mm-hmm. than selling them. And he's a, he's a great guy. I'm not saying anything bad about him. I just think like they had had this wide, diverse collection of incredible animals like you've never seen. They, I don't think they've had that diversity ever since that guy left. So he was probably a little before his time as far as employment there, because if he'd been there as they built the zoo, it'd yeah. be one of the cooler reptile zoos ever. But as it was, they were online retail. So we had stuff like Corrales, Rauschenberger eye and, you know, all kinds of super weird, uh, you know, like Mexican reptiles and really exotic, crazy stuff. Um, and they were animal rich and, and money poor. Well, he, he ended up quitting and Jay went on vacation and I was just generally competent. So he's like, you can spell well and stuff. Why don't you manage these emails for me while I'm gone. And I've told this story before, but I, I drafted up a thing, an email that was like, hi, I'm the new sales manager here oh, at yeah. Reach Out Reptiles. I don't know you, but I'd like to introduce myself. I don't know if your past experiences were good or bad with us, but if you wouldn't mind writing me back, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. And if there's anything that you're currently looking for, I am excited about this new position. I'm hungry. It would help me a lot. If you were looking for anything and got gave me a shot at your business, that would be much appreciated. Yours truly, Garrett Hartle. And then I mass sent it to their entire email list, which was tens of thousands of people Mm -hmm. and uh, all without approval from Jay. And then I just answered emails and made sales for the whole week until he got back. And it was like a mass amount of sales because I don't know, there were just so many people that got that email it was a good excuse to just start conversations with the customers and get to know them and so by the time he got back i had closed tons of sales you know thousands and thousands of dollars um and then i had a whole bunch of them that i was like halfway through the selling process you know to customer fulfillment and all that Mm. that he didn't have a choice he had to leave me there to collect the rest of that money and i just never left so um so yeah that that was kind of where I did it from there. I think though that people who are interested in starting a business in the reptile industry today um, should really look at how can I master these different skills? I think the the template that's set out for us is like, I will be so-and-so like blank exotics or alternatively reptiles, right? Yeah. And then um, And then I will start a social media channel i will talk a whole lot about my my five animals that i have you know hope that some people notice and um you know maybe give some how-to tips if i'm thinking about giving back to the community and maybe someone will want to buy something and in the beginning a lot of times that's enough you know especially if you have you know like the animals that we deal with our our average animal for sale is like 1800 dollars value Mm-hmm. right across yeah. all boards so if you bought your first pair of superdor free ticks for example and then you had a clutch of them and they were worth around that much and you don't have any real overhead or expenses because you're just kind of doing this nights and weekends and things like that and you can sell one of those you're going to be like woohoo i made like two thousand dollars with snakes can you yeah. believe it that's great yeah, yeah so um and and you can kind of get the ball rolling from there 
but you know, there's, there's so many more things involved with that, you know, um, being good with your money. Like, I mean, basic business things that people don't do, like they don't pay themselves. For example, they think they're profitable, but they're not paying themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're never able to like leave their own job because they, now they have to take on a massive expense of payroll, which is, I mean, depending on how much you make, what is it? 40, 50, 70, a hundred thousand dollars a year. It's going to be the expenses. biggest expense for any business is payroll, right? It is for ours yeah. for sure. And we have lots of cool snakes and giant building and all that. That's by, by far, it's the largest expense for ours. And we're all busy around here all the time. I always feel like, mm, if I just had like five more people, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so five um, more interns, you've got interns. Five more interns and a million dollars more. Yes. So that'll get me through the end of the month. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so there's some basic things that, yeah, I mean, you'll want to generally learn how to track expenses. Mm. Uh, you know, I would say start with like having a good balance sheet and a profit and loss category. Um, some real basic things that you can do with a hobby. And then one thing I think is really overlooked. I feel like I got into this on accident. Um, as a much younger kid, like 14 years old or whatever, I just wanted cool animals. So I'd end up like swapping animals all the time. Like, oh, mm. cool. I got a leopard gecko. Oh, no way. You have a day gecko? Let me yeah. sell this leopard gecko. Maybe I can get enough money for a day gecko. Ooh, look, a satanic leaf tail gecko. Well, let me sell this day gecko and I can get that leaf tail gecko. And I'd climb up this ladder to where as a teenager in my parents' home, I had a croc monitor in the bathroom. I had like a free roam iguana running around the room. I had several different uh, boas, like Argentines and Guyanas and things I loved back then. I had, yeah, monitor, uh, other like Australia monitor lizards, bunch of tree frogs, weird fish. And, and I didn't have a job yet. I didn't have like a real job. Mm -hmm. So I had to, to, you know, you start with what, when you're a kid, like birthday and Christmas money yeah. and sell, swap, stand trade, or... climb up. Did you see our recent video? We traded a bug. Kyle that was Roly awesome Poly. yeah at yeah the, at uh, anaheim right yeah that was pretty fun and obviously people were definitely like throwing down on the trades to help us arc but yes. we started with a roly-poly and ended up trading up to probably the best pair of ball pythons at the show they were uh triple head sunset clown albinos mm -hmm. you know um pair of them for a roly-poly i caught outside by the end of the show so well, you, you set was... it up with a really nice little roly-poly vivarium too don't sell it short you had it, it <laughs> i saw grass <laughs> it was yeah, a that thing was worth a hard 15 cents according yes. <laughs> to my roly-poly appraiser at the yes. it's funny how many people have been correcting me when i tell that story they're like it's an isopod an and isopod, i said maybe sir. to you maybe to you but to me it's a roly-poly yeah but at any rate um there's a definitely a lesson to be learned in the in the context of that is that if you're going to make money breeding and selling reptiles you need to understand the market demand the value of your animals what's your value proposition so if someone really wants to get into retail i've told this a number of times someone will come to me and say hey i have five thousand dollars and i want to be i want to make money that's their goal it's not, I want a pet super dwarf that maybe makes me money someday or anything. Mm -hmm. so I have $5,000. I want to make money with reptiles. I usually say you need to go buy like $5,000 worth of ball pythons or, or something like wholesale, buy them for less and sell them for more. If you can double your money on all of them, you can come back to me with $10,000. You know what I'm saying? If you double it again, then you now made $20,000. And, and that will teach you whether or not you really want to do this. I think most people, if they're honest with themselves, they don't really want to do that. They, they want a cool pet. Mm -hmm. So they want to buy the kind of animal that, that they want. Maybe it's a rhino iguana. Maybe it's a, uh, you know, albino water monitor. Maybe it's a super dwarf. And, uh, and they want to tell themselves in their head that this is an investment and not just, they're not just splurging on a pet so that they can convince themselves and their wives or whoever, husbands, to uh, let them buy a more expensive pet. Because mm -hmm. that's what they really wanted. That's what it's all about. And if it, there's nothing wrong with that, buy a pet, have some fun with it, maybe yeah. breed it someday. But don't look at that as, as an investment. I think truly, if you were like, I want to make some money with reptiles, what you would do is look around to your area of influence and say, 
you know, what do, what do people around here need more of, not have enough of, you know, how can I, how can I do that kind of thing? I remember when I first left prehistoric, I used to get a bunch of phone calls from uh, Brian Barczyk, not YouTube related or any, this is back in 2013. Mm -hmm. And he just knew that I kind of had fingers on everybody that was like breeding and wholesaling stuff. And for his BHB business, he needed more things. So he goes, listen, I can buy as many pie balls, ball pythons as you want. I'll pay X amount of dollars. Um, I really need some OKT corn snakes. I need some, and he'd just give me a shopping list. Mm -hmm. And I told him like, Brian, I have another job. I appreciate <laughs> I'll, 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 if someone asks me to wholesale, to purchase any of these wholesale, I will let you know, which of, of course never happened. But, um, but I mean, there's an opportunity to make money right there. You have mm -hmm. a mega customer, right? And you know what they want. And it's not even hard to figure out. I bet you if you had OGTs and pied ball pythons today, Barcheck would buy them. Hey, Bar check, I got a hundred pods. Yeah, there, there's a reason for it. They're yeah. market staples. And so you can literally just play professional shopper for that person, talk mm. to a bunch of breeders. And if he's paying $75, you know, and you can get them for $65, you know, and you can do that a hundred times, you just made a thousand bucks. Right. So, and I mean, you don't even have to put money out. All you need is the, the credit card to do it swipe your card buy the animals take them to him get paid pay the credit card off you're done mm. you know made a thousand bucks before the end of the month if you can those are the kinds of exercises i feel like more people should do for the business and sales side and then i think we all we all know unfortunately there are a lot of exercises people should do from the husbandry side as well you know where they'll shortcut or short change things that really shouldn't be there's plenty of shortcuts you can make when you keep animals, like the efficiencies, you can find ways to do things better and cheaper and mm -hmm. faster. Um, but it can't be at the animal's expense and it can't cut out basic needs, you know, um, or, or you really shouldn't be in the hobby from a moralistic standpoint. No, I, I, I've always gotten that from you. And I, I think that's probably led to, to part of your following too, which is awesome. Um, a, a few things I picked up from what you were saying, it, it sounded like you just took basically when you're in prehistoric pets, a, a very regular sales tool, you know, customer service, follow up, um, that kind of like Salesforce style communication where it's, you know, nothing is completed until there's a sale essentially. And then you just applied it to, to snakes and reptiles. And in my experience, just on the consumer end, it doesn't exist. Um, there's one or two places I know of um, that where you get that sort of professional interaction, everything else, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of very friendly interactions. You know, you message a breeder online, you get a conversation, you get a price and that sort of thing. But just, you know, like you said, having email lists, having that follow-up, having customer service, having a sales manager, there's a level of importance there. And I think that probably translates a lot um, over to a business is just having that business it, acumen, that boring stuff, the balance sheet, the expenses. Yes, so and those say. basic level things allow you to compete at a very high level in the reptile industry. Because when you look at the any industry you get into, you want to do a market analysis, right? There's a, an acronym SWOT. There's an easy way to kind of look at different things. You say, what are the strengths, weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats to what I'm trying to do? Um, and you want to kind of look at that. Well, I, I mean, most of us can see in the reptile industry that most people are very passionate about the animals. They're so passionate about the animals that they probably are a little bit of a nerd about animals, meaning mm -hmm. they're not very socially, you know, I, I don't know, they're not socially gifted. Not always. And yeah. so, yeah, and, and a lot of people out that are in the reptile industry outright hate people. And so <laughs> becoming a retailer is probably a bad idea for those people. Yeah. You know, you're like, I hate dealing with people when I do have to deal with them i'm super awkward about it um or they don't have good business practices I, I i always chuckle to myself when i see sellers and buyers arguing over a processing fee from paypal or something like well who should pay that i'll only sell friends and family and i this and i that and it's like you're talking about paying three percent on a thousand dollar animal why would you ever talk about this with your customers so unprofessional if you have to sell the animal for 3% more and never say anything about yeah, it. Yeah, 30 bucks. You now charge them the fees. They're protected so they feel good by a service like PayPal and you take the animal. 
You know, it's it's a cost of doing business. We all absorb that cost and therefore the prices will reflect it. But where you need to compete is you can say, okay, what is the reptile industry historically bad at? Mm. And how can I do that better? It's easy in the area of reptile sales because if you're talking about customer service, like, like you mentioned, and the industry is bad at it, then there's already a great desire and need for good customer service in the reptile industry. So you can, if you're good at customer service or can get good at it, you can just jump right in and do that. You can literally read scripts. It's not difficult. A lot mm-hmm. of the business is done on email and everything else anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, so th- those ones are easy. Some of them are, are harder. Uh, for example, if you want to say, Kalatoa retics are cool. They should be kept locality pure and you should pay more for a wild type one than a morph because a morph is a cross. That's a whole new set of messaging that the industry in my particular example had not heard before I got in there and did that. So if you want to break into something like that, that's much more challenging. You got to make 400 YouTube videos Mm. before people start to think that maybe that's a good idea you know, and, uh, so don't start with the hard stuff, grab the low hanging fruit, do a good job on the easy things, excel at it, and then add complexity. Well, and and that brings me to some else I wanted to talk about with you as well, too, is how important has YouTube been for you specifically? Um, I I've seen it progress. Um, I I started watching your channel because I saw Superdorf reticulated pythons. It's like, Oh, I didn't know there was a little reticulated python and, and i started watching it years and years ago and i, I really saw it um progress from a uh, just a really basic setup with the chalkboard in the back to a really fully fledged production machine you guys have a full-time videographer you have two channels how important has that been for your business social media or, or marketing oh, in that way yeah I, I mean it's everything i i don't like cold calling and i was doing all the sales so mm-hmm. uh it's it's two-pronged with our youtube thing I started the channel because anything that you start, like you ever, when, when I talk about salesmen, let's talk about sales for a second. And I'm going to introduce you to my friend, the salesman, who's going to sell you a product. Let's say it's a used car. How excited are you about that prospect? Probably not very. Yeah. Especially if you don't need a used car and this guy starts talking about it. Yeah. Right. On the other hand, if you do need a used car, and I tell you, there's someone out there really helping people like you with used cars. And, it, you know, maybe he's my cousin and he owns a dealership and he buys more than he can get a hold of or something like that. And you could probably get one of those extra ones. You're like, ooh, thanks for the tip, mm-hmm. right? It's a very different kind of approach. So what I started doing was taking my most frequently asked questions and making that the topic of a video. And what that would do is, is two things for me. A, when somebody asks me the next time, I can just copy the link and paste it into a text or email and send it to them. And it's answered eloquently because I thought it out, scripted it, took B-roll, have video examples of it. Mm. And if you look at all our older videos, it's just frequently asked questions being answered. Um, B, what it does is, uh, you know, I I... I wouldn't say never, but it's pretty darn close to never sell retics on our YouTube channel. We just offer educational content Mm -hmm. for free, right? And so what we are doing is helping to educate our customer base in training them so that I have to answer less of those questions. By the time most people come to us, they're like, hey, I binge watched all your videos. I feel like I know everything about them now. I got two, three questions that fell through the cracks and then I'm ready to buy a snake. So it simplifies the process on me. I do a lot of my work openly and share with the public. I do it on YouTube so that when they come to buy an animal, all that stuff is is primed and ready. So GI Joe is our sales manager now, but he doesn't have to go do sales like someone that sells air conditioning units has to do sales. Mm-hmm. He's not pounding the pavement, going door to door, not generating leads, none of that. He's literally just, we're getting inquiries poured in from people who are interested in what we've been talking about on social media. 
and they have more questions and, and he starts those conversations and it leads to sales if it's going to lead to a sale from there. So yeah, it's been, for me, that's been critically important, but again, that's mostly because I am working with an animal that is relatively unknown mm. and it was, it was very much more unknown when I started, right? I yeah. think that they've been trending up. A lot of people have been getting into them. The education, the content is all there now. There's other people catching on and adding to the cloud of information on Superdorves. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad, <laughs> but, it, but it's growing now so that it's there. I think if you were going to breed like ball pythons or leopard geckos, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think you have to educate people so much for example if you look at justin kabilka mm -hmm. he doesn't uh who, who's a genius with all pythons by the way um of he canova. doesn't do a whole what's that uh, of canova right justin kabilka yeah yeah yep. yep um yeah he uh he doesn't uh talk very much about how to take care like he doesn't go through care sheets mm -hmm. in all of his videos that's what a lot of our videos are either care sheets and stuff like that He's mostly talking about the unique genetic combinations that he's making and he's creating a desire and an interest because I think he did what I was saying is, well, where is the need? Yeah. You know, and in the ball python industry, if you step back and you look at it, if I was to give you a snapshot of it, and I'll use it as an example because a lot of people do have ball pythons, so I think they'll relate. Um, they'll say, they, they've probably heard these things, the ball python market is dead all the morphs are, you know, going down in value steadily. Everything is going down. You know what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. there, it's overflowing. It's flooded. It's this, it's that. They say all these kinds of things. So here comes Justin with a completely different message. No one says, oh, ball pythons, just none of us know how to take care of them. Nobody ever said that. We all know how to take care of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he doesn't even address that like I have to with Superdorfs. Instead, he shows you the hottest, most bleeding edge, desirable ball pythons that cost tons of money. And what he's doing is helping you to feel more comfortable to invest more money into the ball pythons. And it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways. He tells you that they're desirable. You now desire them because you can see that he knows what he's talking about. And then you buy the animals and he's created and invigorated a market on something that didn't exist before, even though ball pythons exist, something like the, oh, I don't know what they all are now, the Inferno yeah. or the Batman or right. any of those kind of morphs that he's created. Um, he, he is contributing to the industry. Most of us just say, hey, these are the ones I made. Will you buy them? Please, please, will you buy them? I, I showed up to the show. I've got my table out. I'm here on my phone texting as everyone walks by. Can someone please throw money at me and take yes. one of these snakes? it's not going to work you 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 can't compete if if that is your business model so you have to get good at doing those basic things like standing up and saying hi how do you do my name is carrot what's your name what kind of reptiles you know start those conversations and find out if there is a problem that you can solve to your own financial benefit within that conversation that's great i i, I think what um you pointed out you know when you when you mentioned the swat right um, which is the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's a good. That's a good thing. I I, I wonder about guys like ball the, the ball python breeders because we have heard that right that the the market's dying, the industry's dying. But, but yeah. here's a guy, uh, Justin Kabilka, who he didn't. Uh, no one's inventing these morphs, right? They're discovered, but he didn't discover new genetics. He didn't. Uh, he's not putting out you know never before seen. He's just combining them. He's taking them and, and really studying what they did. And, and I think that's kind of, he's adding that level of finesse because so many, I can't tell you how many tangential friends I have in the hobby who, well, what's your ball python collection? You know, I don't have any, but you know, I'll ask them and you know, they'll have a pie, they'll have a clown, they'll have a spider and this, and they're like, oh, I'm just putting these two together. And then I'm just putting these two together. I was like, do those look good when they're paired? And it's like, I don't know, right. but it's three genes. Here in a guy, Justin took it and said, I do care. There's so many morphs out there. Let's not mix three genes if they come out looking average. Let's find the three that look killer. 
And I yeah, think he's, he's taking them like niche. colors of paint on a palette and right. blending them to the, there's artistry to what he's doing at a level that the ball python world hadn't been seen before. Yeah. So, yeah. It's cool. It's fun to see things that you thought were done and people still impress you with it. I like that. Um, if you if you could uh, address the the cult following of the channel um, of Reach Out mm. Reptiles, you are now a person that has fans. Is that something that you expected when you started selling snakes? And what's your take on that? Um, I don't know. I I don't think so. I I'm pretty old and old school, and I'm even old beyond my years, if you want to put it that way. So to me, having a YouTube channel, I'm like you know you know. Kids are like, oh my gosh, I think I've seen you on YouTube. You're like, well, you know, anybody with an email can have a YouTube, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's not really that special, but some people are like, oh my gosh, it's like a TV star I'm standing next to or, or whatever. That was, um, I would say, unexpected. Um, and it's, it's not even something that I uh, want or chase after. So for some people, that's okay. Like Jay, he loves to be the, that guy. He loves mm -hmm. that celebrity status and i don't think there's anything wrong with that that's just kind of like his thing that he's into um for me though when you say the cult following that was very intentional um when i started again you have to look at each individual sit scenario and see what is needed right with super dwarves there were three four people out there well there's more than that but a handful of people with a couple pairs of snakes that had super dwarves in addition to whatever else they were breeding. No one was like, I'm a super dwarf breeder. Still, almost nobody is like that. I mean, who's exclusively breeding super dwarves? You know, there's a few people that are now shifting that direction. Right. But I feel like we've been for the sure. only ones for quite a while a now. Yeah, more than a few, but it's it's been a slow boat to turn. So what I needed was a community of people that were passionately in love with the animals. And what would be even better is if they weren't just in love with the animals, but they were in love with our lifestyle, you know? So in order to do that, I had to be very honest and vulnerable. We are on our channel. Um, you know, we talk about like real issues. Uh, we have lots of times that we've made mistakes on video that we've, you know, still publish them because I think a lot of people can learn from mistakes, sometimes even better than successes, right? Mm -hmm. um, for sure it's a good teacher but yeah so and then you know and then i i um you know quick to say where our, our shortcomings are and things like that because i know that people will empathize with that and then say oh no garrett you're doing a good job hang in there buddy it's nice to see somebody champion champ being a champion for an animal that they love in the face of the adversity and all that kind of stuff that comes with it and so as they do that, we begin to get support. And I'll tell you what, more than the financial support, like I never saw this as a way to like, you know, make a ton of money or any of that kind of stuff. But um, there are things that I want to accomplish for the animals in the industry that would be, that I could consider as a legacy or an accomplishment long-term. So that's what I'm trying to go towards. And the, um, the emotional support, the crowdfunded emotional support is definitely needed because there are people who are not going to like what you're doing. We certainly have our share of those. And uh, a lot of times they're kind of like that vocal minority. Um, but the, the things they say, the, the damage they try to do to you, your business, your reputation or whatever, for every two, three, four hundred people that are positive about it, one person that's actively trying to destroy you kind of cancels that stuff out so you yeah. just need so much support especially in our our industry um it is fairly volatile i think that's fair to say yep. doesn't matter if you're a super dwarf guy a ball python guy or whatever there are there are very toxic parts of the community especially where like online sharing and stuff like that is concerned um but uh i think the reason for that is not all bad. I think the reason for that is we all care very much. And so we get worked up and emotional about it. And when we react emotionally to information, we, we kind of act like children sometimes like, well, no, you're stupid, you know, and, <laughs> and that goes that route. 
and I'd be lying if I said I haven't gotten caught up in that. Yeah, it's a, it's a different uh, different world online than it is in person, um, and it, it's good For to sure. have those supporters. What um, uh, let, let me kind of switch back again too, and and you had made your name by by really finding a niche that wasn't being exploited when when you started mm -hmm. selling super wars. So um one uh which you may not have the answer to is what's the next super dwarf uh, and two how can we identify it yeah um well i would say i mean i have like my opinions on animals that are cool there are certain things that i look for uh for example is it is it generally keepable mm -hmm. you know if you have something that's like really difficult it's probably never going to be mainstream the addition of morphs helps from a financial aspect, because, you know, if you have two morphs and I breed them together and I get four possible outcomes or something with normals, one of this morph, one of that morph with a combo, I have four products instead of one which yeah. by the end of the day. So the morphs help. Um, and then kind of like just the domestication or the domesticability of that animal is a big deal. Like if they've got bad attitudes and stuff like that, they're they're not going to be ever as popular as some of the mild mannered reptiles that are out there so i think there are certain key things that you have to do but i would say the next super dwarf is there, there's nothing inherent about super dwarfs that made them the it species mm -hmm. it's the fact that they they had somebody as a champion explaining the cooler aspects about them to people who didn't know that before like you said you didn't even know there were miniaturized retics you know yeah and the fact that they're naturally occurring is even cooler it's not some stunted morph or something like that so if you went out and you championed something i think you would be successful with that you can see that in a, a number of different species with you know like there's like everyone knows like their blackhead guy or the guy who has the sure. crazy hog nose snakes or and the people that are at the top of their game they're also operating within a niche they just they might have a more established market where like kabilka again his niche is the artistry mm -hmm. of the combinations it's using the correct combination of ball pythons and understanding what each morph does Right. So like one opens the pattern and one brightens the inside part of the pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, if you put those two together, you're going to come up with these incredible animals. Um, so uh, whereas if you have something that closes the pattern and then the parts that are inside that pattern get brightened, it doesn't matter because you close it all up inside there. So he's using that artistry and that is a very specific niche. Tons of people have breed ball pythons, but he is is going that specific direction with it i really feel there's a, a number of underappreciated reptiles out there that if someone was willing to to step up and champion them they could be the next thing but it's exhausting yeah especially if it's something like for example uh justin is working within a niche with ball pythons but there's tremendous market support industry mm -hmm. support for ball pythons you can buy their food frozen delivered to your door um you can get turnkey enclosures for them that are ready to go uh and and every aspect of their life you can get from triple reptile.com or wherever right amazon uh, you can have it on your doorstep the next day right right yeah. but like a good super dwarf enclosure is something that we've had to like develop and perfect over time yes there are enclosures but it's always problems with them when applied to super doors and and things like that so creating the you know you almost have to create the support industries to your industry if you get into something super niche like you look at chameleons for example they need ventilated cages and in, in right. a time when everybody had was using glass aquariums to keep reptiles they were like impossible to keep well that wasn't really true they just need something very different than what we're offering so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think there's, uh, I mean, I, I'm definitely seeing the African house snakes. I've, I've mm -hmm. jumped on that boat. There's some pretty unique things that are happening with them from the scientific community, even that makes them that much more appealing as pets. Um, 
there's really, I mean, it really is an infinite number of things that could go. It just, it has to have not super specialized care. It has to be fairly friendly and the presence of morphs helps financially. Makes right. sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lori Terini is on and she, she chatted and she said, they aren't the same as many other species though. If people are looking for a family snake. Superdorse makes so much better pets with qualities most families are looking for in regard to activity level and interaction. They make so much better pets than many common species people buy to be their pet and end up disappointed because the species temperament and personality is not a good fit. And it's, that's something I was thinking of when you were saying that too, was it's like, well, any, you know, the next species is the one that gets champion. And I was like, I don't know about that, man. These things are cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, but there's a number of species that do have good qualities they yes. can do it because, uh, and I mean, obviously I agree with you, Lori, but I would say that, for example, like stupidors have a very aggressive food response that if people aren't prepared for, that's going to, you know, like terrify them. The reason ball pythons, I think, are so popular is because of their reluctance to strike or the really short strikes that they, that they have in comparison to a lot of other snakes. Stupidors can reach out and get you if you're not careful, you know, and so that's unpleasant for a lot of people. And their size, you know, we have to, the real deal super dwarves are good size, but a lot of the morphs and crosses need work to be shrunken down and they need consistent people who know what they're doing from a selective breeding standpoint for that to happen. Lori, you have um, snakes that are kind of like already super dwarfed all the way down for me. So um, I don't think you've had to have the heartache of like buying a quote unquote super dwarf from a less than reputable person and having it not at all turn out what you want it to be, which is something that sadly I see every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you work within those uh, parameters, then there's a lot of cool stuff that you could do. Like I always wondered why uh, things like ring neck snakes weren't more popular. I've seen calico and albino stripes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people say oh they're hard to feed but that's only if you're trying to feed them rodents well you yeah. know what i mean there's plenty of readily available diets for animals like that you know so i'd love to see somebody work with those a little bit more i to, to be honest with you i don't know if they're sensitive or something they don't seem like they would be but um but yeah like i think that's a really cool snake having the really really tiny snake is something that we don't have a lot of that's why i like the house snakes mm -hmm. they're a, they're like corn snake girth but half the length so that's really fun um where uh people who because even a corn snake is kind of a bigger snake for a lot of people so if you get something that's half the length again and then there are smaller even smaller species of house snakes that are like I don't know, little pencils and stuff it's kind of like the hermit crab of keeping snakes like super popular uh, you know like hermit crabs are yeah. wildly popular they don't have any morphs or anything it's because people paint the shells yeah so it's like wow what a cool whoever painted the first hermit crab shell and gave it to a kid was like boom there's the the difference between breeding brine shrimp and having sea monkeys you know yeah. what i'm saying like how do yeah. i how do i bring these to the market there's someone that is genius there now I think with sea monkeys, a little bit sad, like that genius probably shouldn't have been applied to them. Yeah, well. um, but, you know, but at any rate, it was genius. So what it's something that if we could rewind just a, a few minutes, something you said that I thought was just spot on. Cause I've, I've had a, I, I work with animals for the past like four years, but before that I've, I've had a lot of sales and a lot of business and a lot of different expert, uh, not expertise, quite the opposite, kind of a, a jack of all trades, master of none situation. But it was, I always tried to learn the product. Um, cause when you said knowing what the morphs do, which one brightens up, which one reduces pattern, it's not just about what it looks like. I could tell you like, Oh, uh, this one, you know, makes some of these snakes like more yellow. That's not really what's happening, right? It's tightening certain pigments and reducing other pigments and right. getting, exactly. getting that in-depth knowledge of, of knowing what's, what it's actually going to do. I think that's the difference between when, cause we've all seen it. We've looked at snakes and we're like, neat neat morph and then you see one picture online and you just say holy crap how did they make that and it's not an accident you knew what what these morphs were going to do i mean maybe it turned out better than you thought but you knew what they were going to do and it's just i don't know it's kind of a rant it reminds me of i used to sell solar to guys with with guys who didn't like know how the photovoltaic system worked so you know if a client asked like for details it's 
how are you going to give it to them? And, and I think it's the same with a morph. You know, if, if you want to say like, well, what, what is the, the income, you know, I want to breed this and you can tell them, no, you don't want to breed that because these two are going to cancel or it's going to be a waste. And what you should do is this. And I think that extra it's much level, more than what's on the surface. You have to be able to spot the potential of that, you know, and, that, and imagine the next step. And that really comes from knowing the product not just yeah. having the product and not just liking the product because we all like it. We all love it, but it's knowing it too. And I think that's a, that's a key, key point. I, I thought of a, an answer. This is a, a real deal answer for anyone that's interested in what the next big thing is. Hold on. In the reptile out, industry. Yeah. It's undeniable. This is coming. It's already happening. I don't know if people realize it or not, but it would be very easy to get ahead of this one. Are you ready? You might not like the answer, uh -oh. but this is what it is. Do you think you know where I'm going with this? No, Probably no not. clue. All right. It's the enclosure. It's not uh -huh. the reptile anymore. Well, I believe that. I and the reason that. I say that, the reason I say that is it's primed from all sides. People are paying. I mean, one of the things I traded up was a, a $350 isopod. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So those are cleanup crews. People are into bioactive. People are starting to bring in the full spectrum lighting needed not only to enhance the reptile's life, but to do things like grow plants and things like that. So people are becoming, yeah, people are becoming very, very good at cultivating uh, multi-species environments. Um, and so what we have seen with only a few things in the past, say, for example, like dart frogs need that environment. So you, you never really see like the perfectly clinical dart frog no. environment, you know, hmm. um, but, uh, but you can, but so what they're doing though, is like the enclosures have always been limited in their size because whatever I can ship in a box is as big as I can get. So if I can only ship a, maybe a two foot by three foot by 18 inch, box or that's the standardized size for material getting cut down um then i can only fit a couple things this big in a, mm -hmm. in a truly naturalistic environment so whoever figures out the, the world is hungry for this whoever figures out how to provide a a step-by-step -step kind of clinical pre think about sea monkeys like mix part one with part two in a plastic cage, I have everything there, just add water. If you can just add water to the reptile enclosure situation, where it's like suddenly I have a, you know, you can create a desert environment or a mm. tropical environment or whatever it is, um, very easily, large scale, you would be okay. The, the trick is not selling it to specialized nerds. There's only so many of us and we are already spending all of our money on toys. Yes. We don't have any more, whatever those toys might be, video games or action figures or reptiles. If you can sell it to the average American mom, you have a product. That would be sea monkeys. I think the average American mom could handle a beautiful kind of like living garden as a part of the house uh, that may or may not include reptiles. So it's not the reptile, it's the enclosure. And it's going to it's going to be sweeping. It's going to be across all species where the most desirable thing to do for an animal is recreate a and a lot of people are doing it in a niche way. But it takes a tremendous amount of knowledge to piece something like that together. What we need is a step one, two, three, boom, desert environment, drop in a collared lizard. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? One, two, three, boom, jungle, drop in a super door free tick you know maybe it needs to be expandable or customizable or something like that i don't know what it is but that will be the next big thing for sure i i see i see a lot of good points there uh, a lot of the new keepers i i i, I moderate a, a few groups on facebook and you know a lot of the new keepers i see a lot of people are not the old reptile people even i'm talking like five years ago when it used to be 
Like I used to get laughed out of the room. Like how many snakes do you have? Five. <laughs> you got five snakes? What do you know, idiot? You know, like it's like why don't you have seventy eight like I do? Um, you know, right. and and you don't know anything. Now it's none of that. People are maxing out at four or five, and a lot of people are like, well, I I have one, and I I don't know. I, I've got a ball python. It's in a six foot cage jungle, you know, and it, the, the whole thing's set up four grand. I don't know if I can afford a second ball python. So I think you're right. Yes, I think people are, and that's the mentality. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and they're very happy with it. They're not complaining about it. It's just I think there's a bit of a shift. There's obviously still a lot of collectors and people who want big collections, but um, I think there's a big shift. Well, the, the, it's, it's a good. pretty big shift, but it's it, everybody. The market reacts to suppliers, so yeah. it's a shame okay. when people go, "I want to be a supplier," and they start immediately reacting to the market, like, "Oh, the industry this and the market that, and woe is me and woe is me." You got to control that, and you are the one that can control that. And the people you look up to the industry, they're not that special. They're just stepped up to control things. Mm. So the shift is this. We had, let's say, 100 people that each had 1,000 reptiles. I have 700 something myself. you know. And so I'm the first one people go to when they want to sell their super dwarf. And I'm like, what is this bass backwards thinking that you've got? Going? I have a lot of super dwarfs. If there's one thing I don't need, it's okay. another super dwarf. <laughs> Except a lot of times I do and I buy them anyway. But but my point is, if you could get one super dwarf for everyone in the world that doesn't have one, that is a vastly larger market mm -hmm. than everyone in the world trying to sell one guy the same thing. So, and the more right. specialized, that's like mainland retics, for example, highly specialized. And the joke amongst mainland keepers is that, hey, there's 12 of us and we just trade all our snakes back and forth. You know what I mean? It's, it's sure. very occasionally do you get a new keeper in that becomes a serious player in that world you know and then stays because the the animal is very specialized yeah so and not everyone yeah, can get the, a retake shift, yeah stop trying wow. to sell stuff to people that already have it you they're tapped out they got you've got five you know like you said oh my ball python enclosure was four thousand dollars i don't know yeah. if i could afford another one but you did drop the four thousand dollars so if I can make the $4,000 ball python habitat package, and then I can sell that to everybody because if it was something beautiful that benefited their home, there's quite a few people that would be, you know, I mean, I don't know about 4,000, but you sure. should have a 40, a 400 and a $4,000 level to that. That's so. it. That's good. Let me, um, we, we got the two more questions and we'll just kind of wrap it up, but, but let me put you on the spot a little bit. So one of, Talking about other needs and things like that. One of the most pressing needs I see for this uh, reptile hobby in the community is, is really solid rescue organizations. So let me ask you this. Let's say six years ago, instead of deciding to build Reach Out Reptiles, uh, you built a rescue organization. What would you do differently? Maybe what have you learned that could carry over into a more charitable venture? What would you say to someone that was thinking about that? What are your thoughts on, on that side of the community, Avi? I would say the challenge to rescues is how depressing it is. We talked about yeah. that great crowd of supportive people that are needed to move forward. Uh, for As a breeder, a lot of you guys know this because I talk about it so much. I do everything I can to where if someone's like, oh, I'm getting a divorce or I got to move out of the country, I got to get rid of almost everything, that Reach Out Reptile Superdorf is like, no, I got to cling to that one with everything I can so that mm -hmm. my animal don't end up in that situation. But um, the challenge there is you're taking in unwanted animals. People hang on to them, especially in a market where there's a perceived value. My ball python is a such and such more. That's worth 2,500 bucks. Yes, I'm killing it, but I paid uh, you know, $2,500 for it. So I have to get money back out and they'll hang on to it and hang on to it and hang on to it until the health is so far gone that it's clearly worthless whoever is taking in at this point are literally risking all the other animals in the facility because the amount of disease and things that the animal has contracted with the lower immune system. So if I was going to run a successful rescue, I would focus on the financial support campaign because they're very expensive. And I would, I would start with my donors. I wouldn't take on a bunch of rescues and then try to find people who could who are willing to pay me to take care of these animals and, and rescue them. 
I would start with those angel investors. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd find some rich old lady who's like, I have no heirs and I want to donate $10 million to make sure animals have good homes. And I'd be like, I would like to see animals get a good home too. Why don't we work together on mm -hmm. that? And then the other thing that I would focus on is having a wealth of volunteers that come in, are educated, care for animals, and then get out before they're so burned out. Mm. Because what happens with the rescues, a few people hang on so long that they just absolutely hate humanity by the end of it because of what they've seen done to animals. And that's where all this like opposition and legislature and everything comes from in the first place is how bad we are as a species at keeping animals in captivity, not just reptiles, dogs and cats are, you know, the more reptile, the more people have a certain animal, the more you see it. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. I think that that would be great. Um, but uh, someone is going to have to focus on those. And then just like a paradigm shift where I went after a new market, a new niche with the super dwarves, your market would then be breeders and keepers. And the thing that you would have to teach are the signs that you shouldn't own a reptile anymore and why you should be willing, even if it's $2,500 animal, to rescue it out before it goes into a health decline so that I can hurry up and find a good home for it. And the way that rescues operate now within the reptile industry, all too often people who call themselves rescues are really just flipping reptiles. Flippers, for sure. They get stuff for free. They try to sell it for more. They say it's an adoption fee that runs the rescue, you know, and they do need money. Rescues need yeah. funding and they need money. But to capitalize on the animal while saying that you are saving it from that system is just a, it's a serious just juxtaposition that doesn't work at all. So just like I try to build a sentimental value into my animals outside of whatever their retail value is, you need to build the sentimental value that people have for their animals so that they're not waiting until it's hopeless to rescue them out. So I would start with the investors. Uh, my second step would be finding all the volunteers and everything like that. And if you can't do those things, probably don't even don't even start the rescue. You know, donate to someone else who's doing well instead. Try to size them up. I like that, Lori. Um, Lori also chatted in, folks. If, if you guys have any questions, uh, type them in here. I'll I'll, I'll ask Garrett. Um, when we were talking about the you know building cages, she had said uh, we need contractors to build reptile friendly homes, neighborhoods, etc. Designed for reptile setups <laughs> inside with common areas for them to exercise. I could just imagine a, real, a, a realtor giving a tour. I'm like, this is your snake room. Uh, each each community should have an or like a courtyard in the middle of all the apartments. Here's your reptile courtyard or whatever. That's what she's saying. Yeah, each like community apartment have complexes with dog park. parks. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, I like that. And she was sympathizing with you. The rescues are expensive, financially draining, and people expect to be able to dump their animals on you and not provide any support. And I, I yeah. you're right. I see it a lot. I see it a lot with dog and cat rescue. I, I get involved with with a lot of that through work, and it's um, you're so right. It's it's just draining well um last question i have a um a membership to us arc a yearly membership it's expiring in in like four days why should i renew that i i've already paid for it for three years in a row now i don't know do i need any more <laughs> yeah i mean us arc is right there with the rescue you know we started the channel forum and everything and it's so crazy how nobody cares until it's taken away and even when it is taken away like Florida has basically lost everything in the last yeah. several years. And most of us don't care because we're like, not my circus, not I don't my live in Florida. Yeah, I don't care about that. So um, no, that's actually part of a much bigger question that people there's there's this erroneous philosophy where I think maybe we've all grown too entitled. And we apply that towards our government, like, oh, the government's going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. I just pay my taxes and they give me everything I need. If I lose a job, someone will pay me anyways. If I don't have any food, I will go get food stamps. If I need this, I, the government will give it to me. And so we've become very entitled that the government has our best interest in mind. And I think a lot of people view U.S. ARC as a mini reptile government, and it's nothing like that. Right. They, they are not there for that. We, you know, U.S. ARC does their best to provide 
um, good information, promote responsible reptile keeping. They do an amazing job of networking with all the different breeders and participants in the reptile industry. But the truth of the matter is they are more, I've been using the analogy, they're not like the U.S. Army, right, uh, to go fight. You know, they say U.S. Army fights for your rights, and they do, but they're more like, I would say, Paul, Paul Revere running through the streets saying the Redcoats are coming. Mm -hmm. they're, they are mostly outside of the networking and, and promoting more positive reptile keeping from a preventative aspect, taking away the reasons we would need to be regulated. But um, they're more like a, an early warning system. And so, yes, they, they need your money because this is crazy. Reach Out Reptiles is still definitely a small business. Um, but we made more money last year than U.S. Arc did. And mm. U.S. Arc is watching the entire reptile industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry with reptiles and exotic animals yeah. and stuff. Um, they represent that entire thing, and they made less than one small niche breeder, that which is crazy. Me. And I can, I, my my staff are all underpaid. You can ask any one of them; they'll definitely vouch for that. And they do it as a labor of love. Yeah. And I have ten employees: five full time, five part time. Now imagine having to bear the burden of not only people screaming at U.S. Arc what they did wrong all the mm -hmm. time and stuff like that, but but trying to actually accomplish anything with a staff that big against giants like HSUS with, you know, unlimited funding to mess with us, with our lives through their political lobbying. So yes, you need to donate because I'm understaffed. They're way understaffed and it's incredible the amount of work they have done with it, but more than even joining and, and giving them a membership, you need to actually do what they say and participate with your local government. That's the paradigm shift that needs to happen is that the government is not there to, you know, give us what we want. They're there to give us what they want and they're going to make us pay for it. I don't always want what they yeah, think I yeah. want and I don't like paying for it. So if you want to be actually represented in your government, you must make your voice heard. And that's what US Arc is really good at on a shoestring budget. So everyone should join and they they will help US Arc will help us to make our voice heard. One of the most encouraging things, quick story, it's on the US Arc channel. Yeah. I think the video is called Your Voice Was Heard. Um, somebody that had been uh, one of the um, congresswoman stood up in the special committee that decided our fate as a reptile industry and actually read uh, from the text that U.S. Arc was, you know, supplying to people to educate them and help them read, reach out to their legislators. So I don't know who wrote in that actual letter. Yeah. Whoever it was, was taking close points from U.S. Arc. And so it was really cool to see the Senator it was one of the first things that stood up in the community. They're like, Hey, first thing is we should really look at these Lacey Act amendments because listen to this. And they went boom, 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 boom. All yeah. those U.S. Arc points. I was like, holy smokes, like our voices were heard. That's awesome. It was very exciting for me to see that applicable difference that was made. So that's super cool. And, and, and actually one of the, one of the last videos I, I made was just, I, I, I logged on to zoom like this and I, I record and I was just talking into the computer and I just walked through how easy it is to sign up for us arc, how to donate. And then even to, to copy paste the letter that they wrote and, you know, change a name add a little info like the whole video was like 11 minutes of, of doing basically everything I could and um you know four or five days later then uh, they announced that the uh, they took the Lacey Out Amendment out of the Capiz Act so you you're welcome I guess I think I got about a dozen views on that video must have really uh turned uh, turned the pages so. <laughs> good job good job thank please. you no but it, thank you for uh to, I, I told you before but I'll tell you publicly thank you for taking on the the US Arc YouTube channel uh, we talked earlier in this interview about how important YouTube is as a marketing tool and just it, I remember it was, a, I don't know if it was a conversation you had with Phil or, or what the situation was. And, and someone said along the lines of when you find out how much money and how much support and how many, how few members US Arc actually has, you're going to be depressed. And yes. I, I think that's one of the things that we need to realize is, is you, you hit the, the nail on the head is, is that 
they're helping us, but it's stuff that we have to act on. They, they can only go so far and, and we as a community, so far we've done, I think a decent job, but we saw what happened in Florida. It's, it's, it's not even realistic to say that they're helping us. They're just telling us how to help ourselves. Better, yeah. And if we don't stand up and do it, nothing gets done. They, they cannot literally take on the shoulder, the responsibility of the political activity of the entire reptile industry. It's not possible. So yeah, it's not even that they are helping us so much as they're telling us, educating us and equipping us how to help ourselves. But if we don't do it, you know, then there's not gonna be, it's like if you take a self-defense class, it's not because you think your instructor is gonna show up in the middle and of the night when a bad guy's hitting you. you. Yeah, yeah that's, yes, that's a bodyguard. US ARC is not the bodyguard right? They're the instructor. Now you need to go kick someone in the groin and take care of yourself. So get out there, everybody, find your local government, kick them in the groin. That's it. We'll <laughs> leave on that note. <laughs> uh, Garrett, thank you so much for, for coming through. Uh, I want to thank everyone who, who showed up. We've got Ben, Christina Hill, Erica C., Lori Torini, uh, hey, Nathan everybody. Katz was on earlier, Paul D., Philip. Um, Lori says, thank you both. Thank you, Lori, for always uh, showing thank up you. to these. You're great, uh, great guests, always asking questions. Garrett, thank you again so much. Um, we'll see you on the next live stream. Right on. Take care. All right. Take care.